chapter 4, and Char will probably pull the text up, but I just want to kind of walk us through this, and then I'll read picking up in chapter 5. So if you just want to flip over to chapter 5, verse 1. But in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is going throughout all of Galilee, and he's preaching and teaching in synagogues, and he's stopping at different places to teach and to preach at, with crowds of people. And while he's teaching and preaching, he's praying for the sick and sick people of all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of illnesses are being healed. And then people from all around the area of, of Syria, they begin bringing people to Jesus of sickness and illness, demon possession, all kinds of pains of life, and Jesus is healing them. As the crowds begin to grow, and I'm certain they begin to press towards him because of the needs that are being met. If you pick up with me in chapter 5, verse number 1, it says that Jesus saw these crowds and he went up to a mountainside and he sat down. And though we look at Matthew chapter 7 and we see in Matthew chapter 7 a vast crowd there, many feel that Jesus pulled away from the mass crowd at this particular time and found a place to rest. A place where there was a plan with disciples who, it says now, come to him, does it not? In this verse, he went up to the mountainside and he sat down and his disciples came to him. And he began to teach them. And in our series that is simply called Breathe Life, to inspire, to refresh, and to encourage. This is what we're looking at. We've looked at these few verses I'm going to read right now. And he taught them and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Jesus, with each inhale, he exhales the words of this powerful sermon known as the Sermon on the Mount, possibly the greatest sermon ever preached anywhere at any one time by anybody. So transformational. And as he inhales and he exhales these words, it's like life, it's, it's breath. Almost comparable to when God knelt down in the sandbox of life and he framed that first man by the name of Adam. The Bible says that God breathed the breath of life into Adam and Adam lived. And Jesus is teaching and with each inhale and each exhale there is life being breathed, inspiration, refreshing and encouragement. That's why I think when we look at this sermon as Christians, 21st century Western civilized Christians, we should really draw into what Jesus is saying. Each blessed, blessed, blessed. You would know these as the Beatitudes, and there's eight of them, or the attitudes to be. We're calling them in this ser series, we're calling them character qualities that Jesus wants in those disciples because they would be the ones with this apostolic anointing upon their life who would go out and would emulate who would inspire, refresh, and encourage just like Jesus did. It was important for them. As Jesus is exhaling, it was important for them figuratively, but yet spiritually, to inhale everything that Jesus was saying to them. You and I in this series are studying a very important part of what has become known as our mission statement here at North Parkway Assembly of God. And we're looking and focusing on this middle portion of our mission statement. That God, you would help us that our witness to lost people, people who do not know you, would result in powerful life transformation. This is where our focus is. This is what God not only needed through Christ 
to the disciples to do. But here today, we live in a city of broken people, people who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you and I sitting here today, I know, right, with everything that we have going on in our personal lives, with all of the issues and situations and circumstances, aren't we privileged to sit here today and through it all to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of our lives? Do you, are you thankful for that experience that we have today? And what does it do? It gives us hope, not just for tomorrow, not just for next week, but it gives us hope for a future. That when I close my eyes to this life and I open my eyes to the next, my eyes will behold my Savior. And Jesus shares attitudes in Matthew 5 that we've been talking about that he needed these disciples to have. To carry on, to emulate, to imitate his ministry, to breathe life, to inspire, refresh, and encourage. Attitude number one was the attitude, I need help. I can't do it on my own. Attitude number two is I'm sensitive. I'm sensitive to my own pain. I'm sensitive to the pain of others. And I'm sensitive to the things that pain the heart of God. Attitude number three, I'm strong, but I'm easy to live with. It's the balanced life. It's recognizing that in our lives there's weakness, but there's also great strength. And last week, kind of a hard one to swallow, gump, we talked about attitude I want to grow up, maturity. The next verse we're looking at is here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, merciful mercy. The Greek word for mercy, I, I put it up here on the PowerPoint behind me so that you could see it, is the Greek word eleo. And the Greek word eleo simply means the emotion of compassion. And I just want you to find near you just a couple of people real quick this morning to turn to and say the emotion of compassion. Just a couple people real quick, the emotion of compassion. Just find somebody, the emotion of compassion. Hey, this is incredibly important because it's out of the emotion of compassion, especially when the affliction may be considered to be undeserved, that you and I take on this at mercy. See, compassion is within the definition of the word mercy, aleo. This word compassion is something I've been chewing on for the last couple of weeks, and it breaks down to this attitude and you got to write this attitude down because this one is so important. If, if we're going to be the church, we're going to have to have the attitude, I care. I care. I care. I want everyone just to look right at me this morning. Just look right at me and tell me, tell me this. Say, I care. Oh, one more time. I, I love that. Boys, it feels good. Imagine if, let's see, who could we bring up here right now? Uh, Rose, you want to cut? No, I'm kidding. I won't, I, won't, I won't. How wonderful that feels, Chad, to have a room full of people looking me right in the eyeballs and saying, I care. Isn't that a wonderful feeling? Well, how many of you recall... The first time that you fell in love or that hunk of a man or that beautiful young lady. You remember your first love? Some of you are looking at me like, did you have to do that? Because I've been trying to forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to rewind the clock a little bit to uh, Donnie Osmond. Uh, some of you are, I know, some of the younger ones are like, who in the world is that? He used to sing with his sister, right? Remember, I'm a little bit country, and one was a... Oh, what did I say? Oh, I didn't say anything? Oh, I know, I'm ahead of my... Donnie and Marie, yeah, thank you. 
I hope the rest of the sermon doesn't go like this. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Donnie and Marie. And if I rewind a little bit back to when Donnie was really young, he recorded, I remember it being a 45. I know the younger crowd doesn't know what this is either, although vinyl is coming back. Uh, for whatever reason, and, and it, there was only one song, one hit song on that 45 that I used to play on my very first little phonograph in summer, what in the world is a phonograph? Uh, okay, think CD player, and I used to put the Mickey Mouse hand would go right on the, did anybody else have a little Mickey Mouse phonograph? I mean, those were, and I put the little hand on Mickey, on that, on that little 45, and the song back then was and they called it Poppy Love. <laughs> you got... Oh, remember Puppy Love. And Stan, you know what they used to say, right? Is that it's real love to the puppy, <laughs> right? <laughs> puppy Love. If we rewind, I'm sure all of us could think of those first few that first love or the first few love experiences of our lives. Unfortunately, though some of those puppy loves were full of excitement and dreams, some of them became more like a nightmare. Maybe Johnny Cash had it right when he recorded and sang the song, I've been flushed down the bathroom of your heart. Please don't look around. <laughs> just, just keep looking right up here at me. Please don't look around. <laughs> uh, columnist Lewis Grizzard, and a lot of you wouldn't know who he is, but Lewis Grizzard made his claim to fame by writing about life's woes. And in one article, he was dealing with his own failed marriage, and he, he writes this. He writes, she tore out my heart, and she stomped that sucker flat. We, we laugh, we laugh, but isn't it true, if I could just kind of, you know, pull the reins in a little bit, I don't mean, I don't want to depress anybody today, but isn't it true <laughs> that broken relationships represent a lot of pains that people are experiencing today? They sure do, but along with the pains of, of broken relationships, people today around us, maybe you work with go to school with, attend college, will attend college this fall with, neighbor, family member, maybe one of your kids or your grandkids. There's all kinds of pains that people experience today. Hearts are broken and kind of ripped open and, and, and bleeding and just that which goes along with all of that. But not just relationship issues, but, but people today are facing, facing things because of poor choices that they made in life. And I stand here today, you know, and all of us sit here today. And how many of us could be honest here this morning and say that if you could rewind time... <laughs> You'd go back and maybe change some things that you did or some places you went or some dates you went on or some things you smoked. How many would? Okay, just because I said things you smoked on the end, it was the package deal, okay? I wasn't talking about just smoking things you shouldn't smoke. But we all sit and stand here today and if we could rewind the clock, we'd change some things. Well, those things really do make us who we are. Even though your job and my job as a good Christian parent is to help guide our kids and navigate our kids through life so that maybe they don't do some of the things we did, say some of the things we said, get involved in things that maybe we got involved in. That's part of our job as a good parent to do. But unfortunately, people do. They make poor choices, and there's a lot of pain in their lives, and you work with them. You're their You're their neighbor. Maybe you're their parent or grandparent, aunt or uncle. Made poor choices when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to alcohol, drugs, money, sexuality. Poor choices. Even spiritual decisions. Do you know there's people in this room, people in this room who made some very poor spiritual choices in your younger days? Maybe it was playing with a Ouija board. 
seances. You know, seances has really, in the last 10 years, has kind of had like some revitalization. It's like really become something big. I'm certain it has nothing to do, and I'm being sarcastic, with all of the occultism that we see in cartoons and Hollywood and movies and even on the internet. I'm certain it doesn't, again, being sarcastic, but, but seances and, and things of the occult are being practiced. And you know what it does ultimately? It leaves people painful and broken. More broken. Spiritual decisions. Poor spiritual decisions. But this is what I enjoy is, is that I, I can get a pretty loud amen and some applause here this morning if I were to say that some of you who maybe walk some of those troublesome waters and maybe even some here today who walk through some occultic practices that you wish you could rewind the clock and go back and not do that. But I tell you what they did do for you is they made you fall in love with Jesus so much more because when you realize how bad and how dark darkness is, you truly realize how light the light is and you love Jesus today fanatically because you know what it's like to be lost and now you know what it's like to be saved can you put your hands together and give the Lord some praise today we know what it's like to be saved many people attempt to hide their pain and their hurts you know through laughter you know I've and you've been too, you know, talking with people and just stupid things we did. And, you know, we, we sometimes laugh about it. But as I thought all week long, I was thinking, you know, sometimes we don't realize that what some people say through laughter causes them great pain and tears at night. Compassion. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament... Mercy is seen. Mercy from God. Mercy, New Testament, Jesus. Mercy from prophets. The hand of God being outstretched. This is what Jesus needed from these disciples to breathe life, to inspire, to refresh, to encourage. People of mercy. We've been shown mercy. And because we've been shown mercy, we know how to give mercy. And that translates to compassion. The Bible talks a lot about compassion. If you want to jot this next point down, the point is basically compassion, feelings, and actions. And I want to take you to Luke chapter 10, verses 33 to 35, real quick. You can go there in your, your phone, your Bible, however you can get there. Or you can just look at it here on the PowerPoint behind me this morning. You'll know this story. A man, while on a journey, is beaten half to death, and he's robbed. And this is what it says in verse 33, that a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt what? Compassion. Come on, say that out loud with me. Compassion. Uh, how about mercy? Say that out loud with me. Mercy. He also felt compassion. Felt compassion, and he came to him. He bandaged, bandaged up his wounds, wounds. He poured oil and wine in them. He put him on his own mule, and he brought him to an inn, and he said, please take care of him. On the next day, he, would, he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper, and this is what he told the innkeeper, I love it. He says, please take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. I don't know if I put this word, I hope I did, up on the PowerPoint, the Greek word for compassion I'm just going to let you know this morning, I'm not going to attempt to try to say that one. I'm not going to try to try. Yeah, so you go ahead. I hear some splash. It's kind of like Worcestershire, right? You say it real fast, and nobody, when you slow down Worcestershire, Worcestershire, you just have to say it fast, right? Worcestershire, splash, and those all mine. Who knows? This is quite a, quite a Greek word in Scripture, in the New Testament, that we find a few times in the New Testament. It's the Greek word for compassion. And this is what it means. Now, this is going to be a little bit out of the stretch, maybe for, for some, because when we look at this, who talks this way today? It actually means to have the bowels yearn. Now, there's a whole group here today that when we talk about having the bowels yearn, they're thinking of something completely different than those of us who are about 50 years of age and over. Just being honest, being honest. But this is a powerful word. In the Greek. 
Because this word, whenever it's seen, I love it, Nancy, because it's not just compassion felt. Oh, I feel so bad. Pity. I hurt. Oh, my child or my grandchildren or my neighbor come in to talk to my wife. Honey, you'll never guess what my neighbor told me. I, I'm out weed whacking by the fence and, and waved. I felt to turn the weed whacker off and talk to the neighbor. You'll never guess what the neighbor told me today. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Either for your own children or grandchildren or maybe for a, a friend or maybe just as Holy Spirit when you're in the community and you see people acting in a certain way and doing certain things, can you just feel your insides going, oh, how many have ever experienced that before? You know what I'm talking about. Compassion, pity, oh. You see somebody in such a poverty-stricken state that it's impacting their children. And the children have shoes on their feet with their toes popping out the end and their jeans torn. And I'm not talking about the cool factor. And, and, and a shirt that's either way too big or the shirt's way too small. And their, their nose is running with white and green. And mom is dragging them along the way. And you, oh, God. In the Greek, they called this the bowels yearning. I know we don't talk that way anymore, but I also wondered this this week. As much as we don't talk like this anymore, I wonder how far we have to go to find someone who cares so much about people who are so broken that they are not only moved, oh, with pity, but they are moved with compassion that moves us not only in the emotional, but it moves us to action. It's amazing to me to understand that for every single need, the Lord always has an appropriate response to the needs of people, and He relies on people being His hands. This is the message this morning. How many in this room would be willing to be the feet, the hands, the voice? How many in this room would be willing to reach into the wallet or the purse when needed at times, moved to help people? We've been talking a whole lot, haven't we, about the true life? life. We had Dustin Barker here from... from uh, a life Church Leadership College, and he shared with us about, about witnessing and sharing Christ with people. Powerful. And we've been promoting, and if you ever need those little cards, please get them. Come to the office or see somebody in the connecting point because we want you inviting people to church. That is so important to get people into the house of God to hear the word. But, but listen, this is Sunday to Sunday and, you know, some small groups through the week. But, but you, you are the one... Who, who does God maybe want you to share true life, breathe life into? And whether they're accepting of it or they say, well, you know, thank you very much for sharing, you know, with me today. We had Frank, we had Peggy share a couple of, uh, a couple of different scenarios with us last Sunday here of, of people they've talked to. And many of you are sharing how you're just opening the door by giving somebody a card and then they kind of say, oh, what's this about? Oh, I just want to invite you to our church. And it just opens the door and then all of a sudden there's room for conversation when somebody says, oh, I haven't been to church in a long time. But you know, I used to go when I was a little one. I used to go to Sunday school. Oh, and the door is wide open to just simply say, oh, well, what was it like when you went to church? How did you get to church? Well, somebody picked me up. I was talking with my wife this week about, about a, a lady that is a, a friend of my wife's. Uh, she lived in my in-law's home for a short period of time. And just a young lady who came out of a horrific situation, someone I know, I don't know as well as my wife, of course, because she lived with my wife for a time period, got married, is a pastor's wife today. I know that she went to what used to be one of our AG schools, Zion Bible Institute. Now it's called North Point um, up, up in the Northeast. And I just asked Karen, I said, well, 
boy, she come out of a home where, you know, mom died at a young age. She was young when mom died. Dad was, you know, uh, family influence. Uh, she's a pastor. How did that happen? And I didn't even know she grew up in the same town my wife did. And Karen said, well, it's because her home church, Mars Hill Full Gospel Assembly, not the Mars Hill that Paul preached on, but Mars Hill, Maine, was very evangelistic. Remember the day we used to make it a, a big mandate in our church to go knocking on doors, looking for little ones to bring to church? Remember those days? Well, this, this woman, this pastor's wife today, was one of those. Went on the bus. When she got of age, she was in youth group, and God got a hold of her life through a church ministry. Hallelujah. But it took somebody to drive that van or that bus, somebody to knock on the door, somebody to make the invitation, and some really good church volunteers and church leaders to minister to a young woman who today has an incredible ministry in the district that she's a part of. Isn't that a beautiful story? Somebody had more compassion than they did fear to go knocking on a door. Somebody had more compassion than fear to share the gospel through their personal testimony with you. You're here today because somebody was the hands of Jesus, the feet of Jesus, the voice of Jesus. I'm thinking right now of two or three people that were key in my life would you just pause if you're watching us from home or if you're driving and your wife's got this on while you guys are driving and you're just kind of listening. I wonder if all of us could take a moment to think of two or three key people in our life that were used of God to breathe life, inspire, refresh, and encourage. And you could say, because they were obedient, they had a great big part in why I'm here serving the Lord today. Would you just think of some people, and I'm going to... Right now, myself, I'm putting a couple people, two or three people, putting them on my mind. I have their names. I see their faces. They're on my mind right now. Whether they are past and have become promoted veterans, or still live here today in your community, still alive, I wonder if we right now could thank God for these people who were instrumental in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for each one of them. They were emulating Jesus. They were imitating Jesus. And that's what Jesus needed from this group. As time was ticking, just three and a half years of really a public ministry that Jesus had before going to the cross. of He needed these disciples to have these attitudes, transformation of their minds. And this last one, blessed are the merciful. Compassion. I need you. I need you to be compassionate. I need you to have a compassion that moves you not only to pity, but it moves you to doing something with people who are broken. In closing, Jesus emulated this, or Jesus taught this, hoping that it would be emulated. A few stories that come to mind, John 2. Jesus and his disciples, I have some beautiful, uh, the internet can be a wonderful thing. It can also be a terrible thing, but the internet can also be a wonderful thing. Here are some just wonderful pictures of each little story I'm going to give to you really quickly. The first one is Jesus and his disciples go to the wet wedding uh, in Cana of Galilee. And you remember this. You remember the miracle of Jesus turning the water into wine? What would you say? Sure, I remember that one. Listen, you read that. You take from that whatever you want. When I read that, you know what I get from that? I get that Jesus, his first miracle recorded that we feel was recorded of turning the water into wine. I feel like it was something that Jesus did. Why? Because he had compassion on the family. <laughs> This was the third day of the wedding celebration. I know, I'm feeling the pain in my pocket. I've, I've got three daughters, one, one married, 
<laughs> Two more to go. I can feel the pain. Can you imagine if your daughter said, Dad, uh, I need a three-day party, three days of celebration. I mean, you're thinking, oh, my goodness, how am I going to get through just taking care of the few things i got to take care of and, and the one meal that we have a- after the wedding. And this is three days of celebration is what was, is what was normal. It, it was normal for, for them. And on that third day, they're running out of wine. How embarrassing. 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 And Jesus turned the water into wine and spared a family from embarrassment. Again, you can read that story and take from it whatever you want. That's what I get from it. Matthew chapter 15. (laughs) Jesus took seven loaves of bread and took a few fish. Told his disciples to disperse it to the massive crowd that was there. 4,000 men is what it says here in this one. There's a couple different stories. In this one, he feeds 4,000 men and then the women and children. So who knows how many were actually fed on that day. Now, again, you read this story. Take from it what you like. But let me tell you what I get from it. Why did Jesus do this miracle? To prove that he was the son of God? Well, it could be maybe a little bit of it. The, the miracle. The miracles were kind of proof of God's anointing and upon the life of Christ. But let's go a little further. Let's move away from the external and move to the internal. Many of them had been there for a while hearing the sermon from Christ. And it was going to be a long journey for them, some of them back to their homes and cities. And Jesus, out of compassion, Joe wanted to make sure That a crowd was not weak when they went, but that they were strong physically. And they were fed simply so that they would be strong before heading back to their homes. John chapter 5. I like this one. We know this miracle. Jesus at the pool of Bethesda where there was a man who was lame. He was He was unable to walk and had been that way for many years. And Jesus healed him. But many failed to read the the preface or the foundation of this story. That before Jesus could get to the pool of Bethesda, he had to go through what was noted as the sheep gate. We'll just leave it at this. That Jesus had to walk through a place that might not have been pretty. A place that might have been a little more messy than it was pretty to get to the man who would receive a miracle. Why would he do such a thing? Compassion. Mercy. Come on, everybody, shout mercy. Mercy. Come on, shout compassion. Compassion. John chapter 11, probably my favorite. I've only got a couple more and we're done. My favorite in this lineup is when Jesus stood outside a a tomb and cried, Lazarus, come forth. And we know the story that it's from the tomb. Huh, Donna, that you've taught this a few times, I'm sure, that Lazarus comes forth, a man who was dead. You read the story, take from it what you want, but I'm sure you'll also find this if you read it. What, what stands out to me and I take from this is when Jesus got to that place, his heart broke. Lazarus was a friend. His heart broke, but he also looked at the family. I think I have a picture here. It's, I think it's the next one, Char. I think it's the next picture of him embracing the family. You read it there. The great tears were being shed. Is it possible? Oh, we know the significance of the miracles of Jesus, but could there be a piece of truth here that when Jesus called Lazarus forth from the dead, that it was because of compassion for the family who had just lost their brother, their friend. Mark chapter 6, the next slide. I like this one too, but as powerful as it is, I think the Lazarus one is my favorite. Jesus sees a great crowd and his heart broke. This is the portion of scripture where you read that he saw them like sheep having no shepherd. And then if you'll stand with me this morning all over this place. 
Luke chapter 23. Jesus is suspended between heaven and earth. Now this is really a nice picture to be, I know look, it looks brutal, doesn't it, a little bit, but, but let's be honest, this, this isn't anything even compared to what the man Jesus looked like on the cross. Many would say the beatings were so severe, the pulling of his hair, the plucking of his beard, fistfuls of hair, that, that outside of maybe his own mother who raised him and his closest of friends might not have even been able to recognize him upon the cross. I know this seems like a picture of gloom and doom this morning, but you know what? To me, that cross represents my statue of liberty. Why? Because it was Jesus with full control of his mind, with eight-inch spikes driven through his hands and driven through his feet, with every, with every breath, it is said that he would have to lift himself up to, to broaden the cavity of his chest in order to fill his lungs with some air before he exhaled. And do you remember one statement recorded, documented by gospel writers that Jesus made when he possibly... Pam lifted himself up, took his breath, and it was heard and recorded him cry out to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Next slide, please. Jesus was an example of the life, Danny Woods, of compassion. He was strong, but he was easy to live with. The Garden of Gethsemane, Father, thy will be done. He was a man who knew. He was 100% God, but 100% man. He needed Father's help. I care. 